Good evening. Thank you for joining us once again. This is our current events program that we do every Friday night in English. My guests today are the Shadow Minister of Justice, Dr. Uh, Jason Atsapardi and Dr. Maria De Marco, who is the Shadow Minister of Finance. We are going to uh, focus on corruption today. Um, joining us by Skype from the United States, from Boston, is Professor Nico Passas, who is a criminal lawyer and he's also a specialist in criminal justice, anti corruption, and money laundering. So I hope we can provide you tonight with a discussion that's going to be of interest to you. Good evening, good evening, Professor Passas. Good evening, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, good evening to you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Uh, before I proceed, uh, perhaps you can tell our guests and our audience a bit more about your speciality. Well, I started my career as a lawyer um, in Greece. I started with the University of Athens. Then uh, my career took me to France, where I did my master's in criminology and, uh, and penal science, and my PhDs from the University of Edinburgh, where I did um, a study into sociology of law. And uh, I have worked in uh, the UK and uh, moved to the United States in uh, 1989. I have been working ever since on the areas of uh, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, and uh, illicit financial flows through formal and informal channels. And among other things, I have drafted the legislative guides for implementing the UN conventions against uh, corruption and against transnational organized crime and contributed to their online legal library on national legislations against uh, uh, corruption. And also, the, uh, I, I designed the checklist that is used in order to assess the country's progress in implementing effective implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption, among other things. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, and we've spoken this morning. I've spoken with you this morning. And uh, you were very aware of the corruption that we're facing on our island. And therefore, after a series of um, different types of corruption, which has been happening over the last few years, I'd like to come to today and this week and the events that happened this week, which I'll pass on to um, Dr. Atsopardi to shed some light on. Uh, well, first of all, I think the most glaring and uh, uh, shocking uh, news or, or revelation was personally and for uh, many people who, uh, who have spoken to me uh, were the words uttered by the Prime Minister the other day when he brazenly uh, shifted the goalposts and in order to defend his ministers practically said that it was okay, there's nothing wrong for a minister post November 2018 when it became publicly known that the individual with the name of Jürgen Fennec was the owner of the secret company in Dubai with the name of 17 Black, which company was the vehicle in order to bribe, corrupt a minister, Konrad Mitzi, the chief of staff of the prime minister, Keech Cambry, and other public officials to the tune of thousands of euro every day. So post November 2018, when thanks to not the government, but thanks to Times of Malta and Reuters, so investigative journalism, we got to know that Jürgen Fennec was the owner of this secret company. And Robert Abella, our prime minister, the other day said, there's nothing wrong if a minister, one of my ministers, had a communication with, had dinner with, met with, cavorted with, Jürgen Fennec, who was the owner of the company bribing public officials. He said that as long as this communication did not take place after it became known 
after the involvement of Jürgen Fennec in the assassination became known, so that's okay for me. And over there, he was trying to pull wool over our eyes in the sense that it became known the involvement, the alleged involvement in the assassination became known when he was arraigned in court, 1st December of last year. It cannot be. Surely the Prime Minister doesn't want us to believe that a minister could have communicated, had dinner with the individual concerned after his arraignment, because mm -hmm. after his arraignment, he was and still is under preventive custody in jail. So what I'm trying to get here is, it is simply not on, it is a brazen, obscene, disgusting lowering of the bar, of the standards, when the Prime Minister says that it's okay for him, that the Minister, even himself, because if it's okay for a minister, it's okay for the prime minister. Can I ask, are we speaking about one person here or more than one, one person? I, I, I can only say that the prime minister, in his comments to the press the other day, mentioned specifically the minister for justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have, one has to ask him why he felt to say, he felt the need to say that if, if, a request comes before cabinet on behalf of this individual for a presidential pardon, uh, he would ask the Minister of Justice, just imagine, the Justice Minister, to leave the room. So it's only natural to presume and assume and arrive to the conclusion that it's only because of a certain kind of relationship, familiarity, between the Justice Minister and the person concerned. Yes. Now, in our democracy, in any democracy, is this the benchmark of good governance? Uh, Professor Passas, um, you've heard what Dr. Azzopardi is saying. Um, what are your views about this? I mean, you deal with corruption from places all around the world. Is this quite common? Well, uh, it will not surprise you to, to hear that uh, I haven't uh, visited or studied a country that is free of corruption. We have problems and some are more uh, obvious and in your face than others. Uh, there are two questions here. One is conflicts of interest and inappropriate uh, uh, behavior and the perception of uh, uh, a conflict of interest or inappropriate uh, relationship. On both counts, it is the responsibility of governments to ensure that uh, the confidence of people is, uh, is strong and high, that nothing untoward happens. So um, when someone is in protective custody, when someone is under investigation, uh, one usually is reasonably careful to at least protect appearances. In your opinion, um, let's say we're dealing and we're working towards a country which is free from corruption, what should happen in this case? Well, the work for anti-corruption is actually cut out for us. I mean, we do have our work cut out for us. So there, there is no country where there is no room for improvement and uh, major improvement. The question is uh, where there is political will and where there is enough pressure from below, above, and outside uh, to move the needle, to do something effective. Uh, without a, de a genuine design, desire to do something about corruption, fortunately, we just go through the motions. We just introduce laws that uh, do not get enforced. We just have uh, institutions that do not do their job. And we just uh, have uh, a, a, a theater, uh, some of high quality, some quite amateurish in different parts of the world. So the question is, and in my view, in order to be pragmatic, what you have to see in practice is A, some leadership, someone who truly wants to make a difference on the ground. And two, you have to see in conflation an alignment of interests where there are, in fact, some incentives for people to contribute to a solution. That includes not just the government and opposition parties, but also the private sector, civil society, the press, academia, and so on. In many countries where corruption is embedded, unfortunately, 
sometimes what it takes in order to get the whole endeavor against corruption moving is some external pressure. And sometimes that is what is uh, 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 what is necessary. I have seen that in one country after another. Sometimes internal dynamics allow this to happen, but this is what it takes short of a revolution. Dr. DeMarco, your comments about what we've been talking about. Well, uh, so to, to add to, to what the professor has been rightly saying, First of all, the importance of civil society. As we all know, the corruption we've been witnessing for, not now, but for the past couple of months, but really for the last number of years, is corruption which came to light, I believe in February, March of 2016, when there was the revelation of the Panama Papers. Yes. Uh, and when there was the revelation of the Panama Papers and the person to first reveal it on our social media was the late journalist Daphne Kawana Galizia, who paid with her life for such revelations, okay, it came to be known that when Labour was elected to government in 2013, one of the first things that the chief of staff, not of any ordinary junior minister or of any ordinary minister, but the first thing that the chief of staff of the prime minister did upon being appointed to the prime minister was to open a company in Panama and to have the shares of that company in Panama held by a trust in New Zealand. And one may ask, what interest does the chief of staff of a prime minister, which has just been swept to power after 25 years in opposition, have in opening a company in Panama, literally a few months after his appointment. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't alone in doing that. The most important minister in the cabinet of the Prime Minister was the Minister responsible for energy, Conrad Mitzi, did the same thing, identical to the Chief of Staff, because he also opened a company in Panama and he also had those shares held for him by a trust in New Zealand. But there was also a third company which was opened together with those other companies. And the third company belongs to a person who was so important that his name could not be divulged by email, but could only be divulged over Skype. And the sheer coincidence is that the chief of staff worked in the prime minister's office. The minister for energy was then also operating from the prime minister's office. And the third person was so important, more important than the chief of staff to the prime minister, more important than the most important minister to the prime minister, that his name could only be told over Skype. Now, when in 2017, all this was revealed, the prime minister was not shocked did not sack his chief of staff, did not sack his minister for energy, but defended them and retained them. And when we vote for, passed a motion of no confidence in the prime minister, in the minister for energy, okay, the prime minister then, Joseph Muscat, and all his colleagues in parliament defended to the hilt the minister for energy, Conrad Mitzi, and the Chief of Staff, Keach Kembri. These are facts. Now, we know that in January, I believe, of this year, it was December, January, January of this year, the Chief of Staff had to resign mm -hmm. because, as the Prime Professor Wright pointed out, the whole of civil society reacted yeah. to the revelations that the chief of staff was also implicated 
in the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Yes. Okay. The Prime Minister also resigned because of all that mm. was being revealed. Yes. And we are now also two weeks ago, or rather a week and a half ago, yeah. the minister, or the former minister of energy, yeah. Conrad Mitzi, was kicked out of the parliamentary group hmm. of the Labour Party. Now, did all this happen because the new prime minister of the Labour Party had a change of heart? Did it really happen because suddenly Labour government has turned into a new leaf? No, it did it simply because of the latest revelations of the Montenegro wind farm, where we saw the direct link between 17 Black, the company mentioned by Jason, and Conrad Mitzi. And the Prime Minister realised that he needs to protect his interests. Yes. He needs to protect the interests of his party in government. So he had a Hobson choice where he had to sack Conrad Mitzi from the parliamentary group to defend not the nation's interests, but the interests of his party in government. Yes. And both of these people were also going to be paying a higher price. Yes. Sure. Because I sure. want to now mention, yes. and I'll do it later on, the Money Val report, yes. which yes. is directly linked yes. to the issue of anti-money laundering, of which the learned professor is very learned. Yes. Uh, professor, can I refer to you again? Um, when there are millions mm -hmm. that need to be retrieved, can they actually be retrieved and brought back? Or what, is, what, what happens usually? Well, there is, uh, we have a mixed record uh, with respect to asset recovery in corruption cases. The UN Convention Against Corruption has actually made asset recovery and return to victim states uh, a fundamental principle of the convention. It is, in fact, the driver that made a lot of developing countries to ratify in a hurry the convention because they wanted to have their money back. So uh, in recent years, there has been a whole uh, concerted effort to bolster efforts for uh, asset tracing and repatriation. However, we have not been always successful. It is very expensive. It is a specialized area, but I can assure you I'm, in fact, serving on the board of uh, one of uh, the companies that have the technology. The technology exists, and uh, the types of analytical tools that are necessary are at hand in order to track down uh, banks, accounts, assets, and repatriate them. So um, uh, should you have any interest in this, uh, uh, let me know. I can refer you to them. They are not far from you in Switzerland. And the Swiss authorities and entities there have been uh, uh, quite successful in returning assets in, in, in certain corruption cases. Thank you very much, Professor Passas. Thank you for your advice. And I hope we'll join you again very soon. Thank you. Good evening. Um, mm -hmm. to, round, to round up um, mm -hmm. this part of the yeah. programme, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Atsopardi? Well, I don't want to gild the lily, but the, uh, the, the learned professor, I think, is, is hitting the nail on the head. Depends on the political will and when we see what the present government did, actually did not do, as far as asset recovery is concerned, except for bragging that it uh, recovered, I think, a couple of carpets. Uh, recently there was a parliamentary question. I mean, it's a joke, it's a farce. Money laundering basically is intimately linked with corruption. Corruption means theft. Corruption is a tax. We are paying much more than we should be paying in utility bills. Why? because there is corruption involved. Yes, yes. We are paying more than we should when we go to fill the tanks of our cars. Fuel prices, they are artificially higher than they should. Why? Because there is a cut, there is corruption involved. So the need, the professor is, is, is right. There is no country immune or exempt from corruption. What we have, however, as Dr. DeMarco has rightly pointed out, is institutionalized corruption. 
just a couple of weeks ago, there was this report, unprecedented in its language, by the Ombudsman, mm -hmm. who reported to Parliament that over the last few months, corruption has become a way of life. It's a culture. Mm -hmm. The government has inculcated, mm -hmm. instilled, fomented this culture, which has led to the death of a journalist, to the reputation of Malta being practically taken to the cleaners. And as Dr. DeMarco rightly pointed out, Manival beckons on the horizon. And if Malta is put, God forbid, on the grey list, and Dr. DeMarco is much more um, learned than myself about the implications, that will be the major threat, if not the end, but a major threat for our financial services. That is, thousands of jobs. Why should we be put on the grey list? Because Castile has protected a corrupt gang. Why should we, the honest hard workers, pay for their corruption? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. We'll be with you very soon. I'm with Dr. Jason Atzopardi, Dr. Mario DeMarco.